um, for our panel, we have two great policy experts um, from the state level. Uh, Dan Elliott over there from Oregon Housing and Community Services, OHCS, and also Will Mulhern from Oregon Department of Energy, also known as ODO. Um, Dan and Will work closely together to navigate the federal funding that is to come to the state and are involved in developing the programs as well as the policies um, to distribute the funds um, to Oregonians across the state, including affordable housing. Um, so Oregon is expecting to receive uh, $250 million to support energy upgrades over the next five years. This is coming from IRA, BIL, like you heard in the lunch session, um, from the federal agencies. And there's a significant portion, as you probably heard, the Justice 40, 40% 40 dedicated towards um, affordable housing and disadvantaged communities. Um, I know Dan and Will have been very busy navigating uh, with the federal agencies and at the state level to set up Oregon for success uh, once these starts, um, once these funds start rolling through. And I know they plan to share more about that today um, and what's coming down the pipeline. But we're also looking forward to hearing from you and what your challenges or concerns may be with these um, federal funding. Had some great question, great questions at the last session. Um, we want this session to be as conversational and interactive. So at any point, raise your hand. And if you have a question, let us know. Um, we'll take them throughout the session today. Um, so we'll just walk through our agenda today. Uh, we'll do some introductions. Um, and then each of us will do a little overview on the programs and the agencies that we're representing. Um, then we'll get into some questions. Um, I have prepared some questions, but I'd love to just reserve as many questions from you all as well. Um, but I can help along the way as well. And I know that we have some folks joining from Zoom. So if you have any questions, you can type that in the chat as well, and we can address them as well. All right, so I, I did some brief introductions. Um, like I mentioned, my name is Mecca Abraham, and I am the program manager for the OHCS Multifamily Energy Program, um, also known in short form as ORMAP. And I'm moderating this panel today. Um, I'm joined by Dan Elliott with Oregon Housing and Community Services. He's a senior policy analyst with OHCS. Dan brings 25 years of experience in energy efficiency and sustainable building strategies that spans development of national, regional, and local programs and policy. He has served in the private sector for energy saving companies, as well as local nonprofit community action agencies. And prior to his current role, Dan was the state's weatherization assistance program manager for several years. Um, he is an ardent advocate for the low-income communities and for the advancement of energy policies and practices that protect these communities. Dan graduated from Oregon State with post-grad work at the University of Oregon. So thank you, Dan, for joining us today. We also have Will Mulhern. Will is an energy analyst on the energy and conservation team at the Oregon Department of Energy. He works at the intersection of energy efficiency programs and policy, helping to support Oregon's clean energy transition and deliver value to Oregon consumers through equitable and effective energy efficiency programs. Will is supporting a range of new federal funding programs, including the contractor training grant and the home energy rebates. ODO hopes to help communities, tribal governments, local governments, and community organizations access more federal and state energy and climate opportunities, reach their goals, and build the projects that they envision to create a more sustainable future. So thank you, Will, for joining us as well. Um, and before I uh, jump into things, I just want to get a feel for who's in the room. Um, so I'm going to ask for a show of hands as I read off some uh, 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 folks that might be in the room. Um, so do we have any affordable housing owners, developers, property managers? Okay, good mix of that. I think the majority of you all. Anyone from finance and banking? All right, no one there. Uh, construction background contractors? All right, any? Okay, uh, welcome. Uh, anyone on the government side? Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, utilities? Any electric gas utilities here? Okay. Um, anyone working in the energy efficiency industry, consulting or managing programs? Okay. 
And then I guess nonprofits, students. Okay, all right. All right, did I miss anyone that you didn't feel like captured? <laughs> you wanna share where you're from? Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, well, that's great to know so we can uh, sort of cater to what your interest areas are. Okay, before I pass it off to Dan and Will, I just wanted to provide a quick overview on the Oregon Multifamily Energy Program that we refer to in short form as ORMAP. Um, the Oregon Multifamily Energy Program is brought to you by Oregon Housing and Community Services. The program provides cash incentives and design support for energy efficiency upgrades in affordable multifamily retrofits as well as new construction. The program is funded through the public purpose charge um, that is collected by the two main investor-owned electric utilities, um, that's Pacific Power and Portland General Electric, so we can serve projects that are served by those two utility areas. The goal of ORMAP is to reduce the energy burden for residents with limited incomes across multifamily affordable housing. We do that through, uh, one side is through energy efficient building design um, with working with affordable housing owners and developers. And then the second part is through energy efficient building use. Um, and that's where we aim to work with residents so they can understand their energy consumption and uh, lower their energy bills as well. To be eligible for ORMAP, projects must meet the following requirements. Um, be an existing or new construction multifamily property with at least five residential units. And we also serve uh, campuses of duplexes, um, triplexes, and quadplexes. Um, and like I mentioned, due to the funding, um, the, we can only serve projects that receive electricity from Pacific Power or Portland General Electric. And um, because we're funded by the electric utilities, uh, we can only serve projects that are heated by electric heating systems. And finally, on the affordability side, um, we do have a program affordability requirement where residents in at least 50% of the units are at or below 80% area median income. And then those units must remain affordable for at least 10 years. So as we get into talking about um, the, the funding that's coming through the federal sources and elsewhere, um, we expect um, um, that th there are opportunities for us to be able to stack incentives um, and just reduce the cost ultimately uh, for project teams. So if you have worked with us before, um, for those of you who are familiar with the program and those of you who are not, um, we, used, we did um, release a new update to the program this past July. Um, we have a very high demand in the program um, after being on a wait list for two years, um, starting in 2020. So due to the high demand, we switched to a more competitive enrollment process uh, with equitable um, focus um, to prioritize projects with the highest need. Um, so this is just an overview to the new open enrollment structure. Um, we'll be providing funding every six months. Um, and um, asking projects to apply so we can prioritize the projects with the highest need. So if you want to learn more, um, you can check out our website, OregonMultifamilyEnergy.com. All right, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to Dan to share what's going on. Oh, Will? OK, all right. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Oh, very well. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't have any slides for you all. So it's just gonna be me speaking for a little bit. I was gonna do slides, but then I presented the other day and I realized I would just be rehashing the same slides and I didn't wanna put you all through that. So I'll try to be engaging um, in, in this discussion. My name is Will Mulhern. I'm an energy analyst with the Oregon Department of Energy. Um, I handle a lot of our energy efficiency policy work and relevant to this conversation, I work on several of our federal funding um, programs that are coming as part of the Inflation Reduction Act specifically, but also a little bit due to the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and those are what I wanna talk about with you all today. Um, so there's two programs in particular that are relevant and that I think I'll cover now. And then when we get into discussion, if there are specific programs that you'd like me to go into more detail on, happy to do that. Um, but to kind of set the stage with what's coming from the Inflation Reduction Act, um, there are two major rebate programs that it's likely many of you have heard about, whether in the news or because you're just consumers that are eager about these programs. Um, the first one's called the 
Home Efficiency Rebate Program, but it's also known as HOMES. It's had about four different names at this point, um, but it's important. We, we refer to it as HOMES. It's not actually an acronym, but we refer to it in all caps. It's a whole thing. Don't worry too much about that. That's a performance-based rebate program. And I think for this group and for the multifamily context, this is maybe the more interesting program um, because this is focused on retrofitting existing buildings um, based on either modeled or measured energy efficiency savings and providing rebates for those projects. And so the two pathways are either you model based on existing energy use and then looking forward using a BPI 2400 compliant software. We can talk more about that if anyone would like to. Um, or you actually do the project and go through and prove with utility bills measured energy savings. So those are the kind of the two pathways that the federal government has laid out for this rebate program. Um, we're very much, and you'll notice a the theme with both the programs I talk about, we're very much in the early stages of this. We're still having conversations with USDOE about how we can put these programs together in Oregon, how we can meet our needs, and how we can fit within the broader energy landscape in the state. Um, so, you know, I might lack some specifics on things, and part of why I want to have this conversation is to get feedback from you all who are experts in this space on, on what's going to be useful and where we can fit in and make these really impactful for our communities. Um, but I do want to highlight that that program, actually both programs, have an explicit target for low-income multifamily households that USDOE has set for these programs. And so we're very much committed, obviously, to meeting that target, but also prioritizing those communities and making sure that we're delivering benefits to the folks that are really going to that really need them and are really going to benefit from these rebate programs. Um, and obviously, these are also subject to the Justice 40 requirements, which I know there's been a lot of discussion at the conference about. Um, and that's something that we're fully committed to exceeding um, as we roll out and deliver these programs. Um, so I, I'll maybe leave it at that and we can dive more into the difference of um, the performance the performance based rebate program as we get into discussion. But I want to talk about the other program that's kind of coming down from the federal level, and that's the home electrification and appliance rebate program, also known as HEAR, that previously had a different acronym as well, but that one I think is here to stick. So it's H-E-A-R, Home Electrification and Appliance Rebates. Um, and that's focused really on kind of individual households or units, if you will, but it's also applicable in the multifamily context. Um, and so really what the federal government is trying to do with that is electrify households in a beneficial way, I would say. And so there's going to be a lot of rebates. I think the big thing that gets a lot of discussion with that program is around heat pumps. And that's generally what we think about when we think about electrification, at least in the HVAC space. But there's also great opportunity for heat pump water heaters, um, heat pump clothes dryers, electric stoves. It really runs the gamut of a range of different electrification measures. And it also provides kind of the ancillary support for doing those measures. So that could cover panels, switching out a panel, um, different wiring and electrical components, and also insulation and weatherization um, as part of these projects. So that also has a tremendous amount of potential. Obviously, you know, there's some overlap with the projects and or with the rebates and the programs, and we want to make sure that we're maximizing the total benefit by making sure they integrate nicely with one another, but they do kind of have slightly separate lanes as well. So I wanted to kind of just make that distinction and discuss kind of what both those programs are doing. I'll say that we're in the early stages of planning and thinking through this, as I mentioned, and I would encourage you all to be engaged with us as we do this. Um, and so the first opportunity to do that is next Wednesday. We're hosting a forum, um, kind of a public listening session. Uh, it starts at 2 p.m. on October 4th, and you can find more info at the Oregon Department of Energy's website, um, where we're going to start soliciting some input from the public and from key stakeholders on how they want these programs to kind of play out in Oregon. Um, so as I've kind of alluded to, there's, there's guidelines from the federal government. They're pretty specific. But there is enough flexibility within this that we can tailor these programs to make sure it's working with what everyone in the state is doing and what the goals that we have as a state. And we want to use these kind of listening sessions as opportunities to start to get that feedback, start to make connections, and understand how we can best serve the communities that are really going to experience the benefits from these programs. Um, and then I'll add one more thing. The following week, we have two more listening sessions. Uh, one is going to cover each program specifically. It'll be October 10th and then October 11th. 
um, and we'll go a deeper dive into each of these specific programs. So that'd be a great time if you have questions about the multifamily components or whatever it may be to, to attend the session and give that feedback. And I'm also available uh, to chat with anyone afterwards and we can set up time subsequently to have these conversations one-on-one -on -one if you'd like to. Um, I'll just add one more thing. So I think that sounds like a lot and Dan's gonna tell you a lot of other great information and you're gonna be like, this is a crazy landscape of energy efficiency. How is anyone going to figure out how to do anything meaningful with this? And that's where a state bill comes in. So 3409 was the big climate omnibus bill that was passed this past June, I suppose. Um, and a big component of that was it directed us at the Department of Energy to set up what we're calling a community navigator program or a one-stop shop. We're kind of using those terms somewhat. And the idea of that is that it's gonna create a place for consumers or um, other interested parties, whether it be building owners, uh, to go and identify what opportunities might be available to them in the efficiency space. Um, this is very much at this point a directive. It's not something we've made a ton of progress on at this point. We're prioritizing the federal rebate rollout and getting that going. Um, but this is kind of happening in tandem to make sure that we also have a way for the communities to actually navigate these programs and make sure that we're just not creating programs that nobody knows what to do with. Um, so I want to highlight that so we can talk more about that. I'm sure there's folks with really good expertise on that type of work in this room, and I would love to hear about that. Um, but I think I've probably already gone over the time that I said would sp I would speak. So I'm happy to pass it off to Dan. Are there any questions for Will? Any Anybody on uh, on Zoom with any questions yet? Nothing yet? Okay, great. Oh, there we go. The, the, que I'll, I'll, uh, the, the question was, uh, is there a general timeline for the rollout? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, so generally we're anticipating, we'll be, we're hopefully anticipating we'll be delivering rebates by summer of 2024. And so to give more specifics on that timeline, the federal government released their, the full guidance, like what we need to actually put together an application in late July. Um, as I kind of alluded to, we're now entering the process of doing outreach and making sure that we're developing our application in a way that's informed by input from the community. That'll take us generally through the rest of the year. And then um, in early 2024, we're going to put the actual application together, submit that. Uh, USDOE and the entire federal government have processing times that will probably slow things down a bit. And so that's why we're giving that date of summer of um, 2024 to start actually delivering rebates to consumers. Come to you for the question. Will, do you have information on the current, currently open rental heat pump program that was uh, part of Senate Bill 1536? Yeah, um, I can give you what information I have. So I don't work directly on that program, unfortunately, but as you mentioned, that is open and it is eligible for applications at this time. Um, I would have to double check on the income thresholds and the specific requirements for that. But I do know that we have a website that outlines the information and shows where um, building owners can go and apply. Um, and it has more information there. So were there other specific questions or is that hopefully somewhat helpful? Yeah, just... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's up to 80% of the project costs of AMI, yeah. So thank you, yeah, that's also a great plug as well. And then we're also, there's a community heat pump program as well that we're in the process of rolling out. That'll be done through regional administrators who each have some flexibility in, in implementing their own rules, um, but that will also be an additional program and thus underscoring the need for the navigator in One Stop Shop. I, I have to thank Will and Odo for being here at Housing Oregon. Um, this is the first time that I know of that uh, Odo has been able to uh, to come and it won't be the last well um, it's one of those opportunities where we can mesh the two I think you saw it at the plenary at the, at the at lunch today where you heard about climate justice and and uh, the energy programs and the uh, carbon uh, reduction uh, efforts that are going to be uh, happening and all of this is that that culminates into that push and for those of you that have uh, recall the days of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act back in the Great Recession. Some of us were generals and colonels back then running programs. Um, the program was back then was large, really large, and we had uh, three to four years to get those dollars out. And uh, it was a real vital 
impact to our state, uh, but the funding that's coming now is almost five times that amount in almost the same amount of time uh, that we have uh, focused on. And so, yeah, we're all a little, yeah, uh, the legislature saw that coming. That's why they put together the one bill uh, to help provide Odo with the authority and the direction directive that they needed. Um, our department, Oregon Housing, was named as a, as a consultant uh, for for uh, uh, for Odo and to work with them as we collaborate and pull together how the programs can look like in a one stop shop and how they would be packaged. So it would be very simple for you as 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 providers, affordable housers, to be able to come in and check a box for the type of equipment that you would need. And speaking of check a box, I'm going to promote one of your programs. Um, <laughs> uh, affordable housers, put your hands up. I want to see see your hands up. How many have? Keep your hands up if you've got active projects. Great. Uh, keep your hands up if you have active projects that you're looking for additional funding for. Gaps, anything. See, see how this goes? Okay. All right. Uh, for those of you there, how, th those of you that still have your hands up, okay, with that, I'm not done with you. Um, how many would like to see renewable solar, wind? How about solar? How many would like to see solar renewable on their properties be able to offer? Okay. How many would like to see solar storage like what you heard this morning? Great. There is one point, get your pens out, because this is what you're going to do, and I'm going to expect you. For the, the, those of you that are in here, now it is on you, and you're because you, I'm giving you this information, uh, because there's $1.8 million waited, waiting at Odo for their solar and storage program. And it's as simple as you going to their site, pulling off the application. There's an application that has categorical eligibility for all of OHCS's programs, all of them. If you're participating in any of our funding sources, you'll see a list there. Check the box, sign it, and you'll see $30,000 $30, for equipment for solar and storage for your property. Like that. There's $1.8 sitting there. So for those of you in this room, no excuse. You should put in for that application next week, and because I'll know, because they got to come to me and check, check to make sure that you know, you're categorically eligible, so they'll come to us. So please do that. It is waiting there. It is designed for you. It is, uh, we're, you'll hear more about it at our NOFAs. Uh, for those of you that come into our NOFA, we'll be doing some uh, presentations where we do some kickoffs and, and that, but you'll, Odo's gonna be coming and sharing that information. But because you're at the conference and we haven't had that thing, this is uh, your opportunity to go after those dollars right now. So there, solar and storage, and that's a state program. And all you gotta do is check a box, that's it. We're practically handing out solar like Tic Tacs in the state right now. So no excuse, it's on you. If it doesn't happen, it's on you. <laughs> Just going to put that there. So all that being said, um, there's the promotion for the uh, solar and storage, and you'll hear more of that, and you'll hear more of our programs uh, with the not so much homes, but the rebate program for uh, here. That's the one you're going to want to follow. That one's going to be a little interesting in how they've designed it, the feds. <clears throat> created some duplicative elements to it that uh, our state being a little bit more progressive than others in how we uh, invest in those dollars. Um, it's going to be a packed field uh, of, of how we leverage these dollars. The beautiful thing is, is leveraging these dollars in a way and what I see will and what we're seeing right now is we should see some profound, profound improvements, uh, energy uh, uh, and resiliency. Um, uh, on our new housing stock, uh, the, the properties that you're doing. When we're looking at zero net and we're looking at getting to those types of things, that's the kind of machine we need to see in a building moving forward into the 21st century, at least by the end of the 21st century. Uh, the sooner that we can get things like that established, we are going to have customers, you're gonna have uh, people, uh, just like we didn't have the internet, years ago, but now it's expected as part of the utility package, right? People are going to expect to see this type of equipment where it's their buildings are producing as much, if not more, of the energy they need and use in their units. That has to happen for the type of community uh, and the type of nation of consumers we are. That has to happen. So the technology and the science is here, um, uh, and the gates um, are going to be put in place. We're going to make sure the doors are there. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. What I want to do is give you guys an overview of 
of the other programs that we also run. So you heard about the Oregon Multifamily Energy Program, and that's specific to Pacific Power and Portland General Electric, but it's state or ratepayer dollars. And because it's state or ratepayer dollars, it'll go beautifully matched with a federal rebate. Federal funding doesn't match real well with other federal rebates because you have to use it again. There's restrictions to it. It, it, it blends nicely if you don't have other resources to do that. Uh, but it also means that you have to spend the money again uh, on other properties, which makes sense. It sh you should be able to do more, but uh, housing is static. There's only so much housing to go around and as we try to focus that. So to be able to everybody get a piece of that pie, this is, this is the great thing that we get to uh, figure out how best to place and leverage all of those dollars. I mean, even Portland Clean Energy Fund, they have half a billion dollars from the city of Portland to put towards. And if you sat in on some of their stuff, that's amazing. Kudos to Portland on that. I think 60, maybe 70 million is being set aside for, for low income and affordable housing that they'll do on that. That dwarfs the combination of funds that, <laughs> almost dwarfs, the combination of funds that we could provide at the, at the state level, uh, just for the city of, of, of Portland. So uh, for those of you that are Portland developers, uh, we expect big, beautiful things coming from the city in regards to having that kind of resource to tap into. That's a half a billion dollars that is there right now. So kudos to them. So the, the several programs that you'll see on the screen before you uh, right now are um, federal programs. That's our platform. That's our one-stop shopping for our low-income states weatherization assistance program. When people think about weatherization assistance for low-income, they think it's all one big funding source. Actually, that's exactly what we want you to think uh, because we want it to feel like a one-stop shopping for all of our customers, all of the, the clients and households that apply for the program. They don't need to see the sausage making. But what we do at the state level is we have to put it together with all of these different programs, seven different programs to leverage the same service uh, for everybody. So everybody gets an equitable approach and the types of measures and services uh, uh, to work with. And they all have their own different goals, their different outcomes different reporting requirements, different amount of admin. It's, it's, it's a glorious um, government, um, uh, what's a spaghetti? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I'm privileged to say having worked on it for the last couple of decades is that we've got it very well dialed in with our partners and how it's put together. And uh, ORMAP, uh, a little bit independent of that, they've got it dialed in well too, working with the Energy Trust of Oregon and now with ODO. So when you come in, to apply, we're gonna be asking you about, did you apply for the solar and storage? Did you do that? We're gonna have that part of the package. So you check the box to make sure you have all of those things. And we'll continue to do that with the rebate pieces too. So we're gonna be very busy packaging that for everybody. So it's, you just know what your building's gonna get kind of thing. So um, we're looking forward to seeing a lot of that. Uh, that, that, that. Those programs amount to about $100 million a year in total. Uh, so what I do want to talk about, and you heard a little bit of it, and you might have heard a little bit more about it, is the uh, uh, Justice 40 initiative. Hey, show of hands, how many, you've heard it, do you know what it is? Okay, it's pretty straightforward. Well, I can't, no, I take that back. It's not straightforward. Uh, it, uh, but the premise uh, that the White House came up with and stakeholders did for this initiative is that 40% of all funds that they'll be putting towards all of these programs and the dollars that you heard, uh, heard at lunchtime will be going to un underserved populations. Um, not only that, but they made some very specific tools uh, by which to, uh, for each state, to identify where these underserved areas are in the state and they were very explicit so they're going to be measuring a state as to how well we're able to impact those communities by funding them um, which will be interesting considering the guidelines they've set up for some of these programs we can't fund specific um, populations by race or whatnot but there are ways that we can go about doing this very smartly and i'll share you how we're we're doing it um, in, in a way that uh, several other states are also taking uh, taking notice and following that as well uh, under something called the energy burden uh, that we did some research on uh, a few years back and have uh, helped. We did with our research and our data, we actually helped uh, provide data to build the tool that the White House uh, came up with, uh, which is, uh, I'll share in a couple of slides here, why don't you go to the next one. Uh, 
This one's just, uh, this slide's just for those of you at home too that are watching this on Zoom. This is just some more information as to, in regards to what Justice 40 uh, expectations and outcomes are uh, and what the communities are. It all came through the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, uh, we received, uh, the state for our weatherization program received almost $40 million for that. Uh, we just received the final distribution of that last month. Uh, so we'll be rocking and rolling too. And so about the same time that the rebate structures come in uh, with Odo, we'll be ready to rock. That's so we've got eight months. Yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah, we got this. And so at those meetings in October, if you can be there to listen in, please do and, and chime in. That's that's where you can hear how the machine is going to be put together. And you get to say and share what you think would be best for you as the customer getting these and navigating through this. The easier, the better. Next. So the tool, so the tool that we're using uh, that they put together and that we are using, Odo's using this too, this came from the executive order uh, 14008. Um, uh, the order directed the Council on Environmental Quality uh, to develop a new tool. Uh, it's called the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool. So this tool is the tool that we use to target um, the state. And so I'm putting, a, a, that's, that's our state. You'll see the dark area, darkened areas. Uh, these are the areas that they would like to see us provide services to. It's not that we don't. It's that we're, what we're going to have to do is provide intense marketing and, and, and outreach in those areas to be able to meet uh, a good portion of the population. You can't make people come into your office. That's the tricky part, right? You can't, it's, they can't, they, you can't make them come in. Also, because of the way we do the work, because it's building focused, not everybody is in a building that necessarily needs the type of measures that we're going to be doing as well, right? So there's expectations. They're going to be collecting data from us because they've never done anything like this before, the feds. So they're actually asking us at a micro level of data uh, collections from our partners in regards to uh, race and uh, the population demographic of the areas so that they can track that and see what our impacts are and if we're able to provide these dollars in an equitable manner and what kind of tweaks we need to make or what kind of tweaks quite frankly Congress needs to make in order for us to focus a lot better on some of the underserved communities. What we did with our uh, by adopting this, uh, Odo's also adopt this as well uh, as we move forward, um, we are going to use this tool <coughs> in a way that uh, uh, we have another, well, I'll go to the next, go to the next one, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the other, this was another tool that, that other states are, have also looked at and they may be using as well. Um, uh, you can see, let's see, that one is called, um, I want to make sure. Uh, yeah, that's this, oh no, that, that's the bloody same one. That's the same one, never mind. Uh, that's the same one, it's just that a, a deeper layer. Um, but you can actually get into your communities. So as you put together your NOFA applications for Lyft or for any other programs like this, you'll go to this tool and it'll provide you the data and you can use it as justification to show that this is an area of underserved populations that you need to pay attention to in, in resolving um, the expectation of how those dollars are going to be used. Um, Next, pay, next, next slide. Now, this is our tool. This is the tool that uh, OHCS developed a few years ago. So this is what we did is we developed energy burden by race. So we took what the energy burden was for every household uh, by race uh, and population uh, in the state, and we did it at the census level. So it's really, really tiny uh, in the Portland area, and we can almost go block by block uh, to be able to identify which populations had the highest energy burden. Uh, there are a lot of factors that take into consideration what the energy burden and the energy burden is determined by uh, the cost of the fuel, the utility costs, um, how much energy uh, they actually use, uh, which is the condition of their home and equipment in some cases, and, and habits. Uh, and then the other part is their income. You know, they can only afford to use uh, so much. So those three things make up and, and, and factor in what an energy burden is. And so we took that data compiled it here. We also provided this map and data so that they could put together uh, the screening tool for the feds because they knew we, we had done something uh, to this effect. And what we can see here is where you can click on any of those census areas in our map and see where uh, what population is most burdened by race. And um, so the populations by energy burden, uh, if you are paying more than 6% of your income, you are considered uh, towards uh, energy bills, you are considered uh, energy burdened. Uh, 
If you're paying more than 10%, you're considered severely energy burdened. What we found between uh, uh, the non-white and white population is significant differences. Uh, so, and when we broke that down by race, we found out that uh, the energy burden for uh, Oregonian uh, Native Americans uh, run around 33% of their income. Uh, the next group after that uh, was um, uh, the Latino population. They run around 21% uh, of their population. So when you look at these numbers, and you can look at it in every given, this helps us know where to go, where to target, and which population to target and ma market to, and try to get that help that population or understand that population and outreach to that population very specifically, because they have the greatest burden and that also helps us we add other layers to this that includes housing stock and condition of the housing stock as well age of the, of the housing stock so it gives us an idea of what the existing codes could possibly be of the, the equipment size so we can add that and weigh that and we can really dial down onto where we need to go and we've got other tools and other maps all ready for you here this next year to be able to share with you along with the, the rebate program that we'll be we'll be putting in place uh, to help so that's that's what we've got is there one more slide Oh, yeah, yeah. Change the topic. Did I see a hand back there? Yes. Just a thumbs up. You sounded good? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, cool. So um, a little change there. Before, I'm just going to change real quick. One of the things that we look, we're looking at is, yeah, we can identify these populations, but one of the things we looked at, yeah, we're getting all this great money, right? But can the state actually, the infrastructure, the business distribution, you know, uh, manufacturers, uh, do we have the businesses to handle all of this, right? Well, during the Great Recession, we could because everybody was looking for work. We're in an inflation reduction plan, which is different, right? So we have different things. We have some of the lowest uh, unemployment rates in the state right now in history. So when we look at that, we started to examine the workforce to see where the workforce was at. And we've been working with uh, uh, other businesses to give you an idea. I think you know this as well as, as developers and uh, uh, the average age of uh, contractors are, are uh, over 50 years old. Not the company, the owner. So when you look at that, you're looking, we're seeing that we, we see a, probably a, a sunset of, of that workforce at a really bad time, right? And so we need we need youngsters. We need some youngsters. We need some new businesses. Okay. All right. All right. You, you see where I'm lining you up. <laughs> okay. So one of the things that the state is doing, we decided to go all in. Uh, we were given some training and technical assistance dollars, and we set aside quite a bit more. And um, OHCS and our energy services team. We purchased a building in Salem on McGilchrist and uh, Pringle. Uh, it is a huge 25,000 square foot uh, warehouse that we are unboxing right now to turn into a training center that we will be training uh, and developing brand new businesses that want to get into this work uh, of energy efficiency from solar and renewable to it'll be our school uh, that will focus on partners and stuff and for your contractors as well and developers uh, that uh, that we're going to be looking at and so We'll be doing that to support because um, we can't wait for that to happen. So we're rolling up our sleeves and we're going to do it ourselves because it's a ne it's necessary to do. And so you'll hear more about that. Workforce development is key to this, and that's one of the concerns that we have uh, more than any in regards to these dollars. <laughs> and that's that's what I've got. I'll stop there and uh, we'll go with questions. Yes, thank you, Will and Dan. Lots of great info there. Um, before I jump into my questions, I just want to see if anyone has any questions for Will and Dan. All right, Jenna, I'll come to you. Thank you. I just have a question about, um, I thought one of you mentioned a navigation tool. So it sounds like there might be at some point a way to go to one place and figure out all the different rebate programs and how they might fit for a specific type of property. Is that true? Is that something coming up? Uh, yes, I, I had mentioned that. And absolutely, that's the vision and the goal, I would say. Um, and, you know, getting from 
this to that being a reality probably takes some time and thinking about the different potential end users that could be using a tool like that um, is going to be important. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, our, our vision is that if you're a homeowner, if you're a contractor, if you're a building owner and you are interested in retrofitting a home or if you're potentially building a new property, you have a place you can go where you can find out what you may be eligible for based on the property type. And that can get you started and pointed to the correct agency or nonprofit or whomever you need to be working with to, to get that. So yeah, 100% that's, you know, what we would like to see. Um, and that's what we've been directed to do. It's just going to take a little bit of time to get there. And just to add to that, oh, you got a Zoom question. Okay. Just to add to that, um, it's going to take time. Uh, it's not going to be all, I think, perfect in a, in a year or, or so. Uh, but the beautiful thing is the funding is going to be here for a while. And so is the law. So this has been memorialized in the Constitution. Uh, this, is, this is a law that has directed and gives Odo the obligation and the authority to put together a platform for a one-stop shop. That's huge commitment from the legislature, huge support for the executive branch, and hopefully some good money for support for Odo uh, to be able to get and put something like this together, which is a long time coming. And so uh, kudos to the legislature for thinking about that. And, and, and uh, given, given, given us the opportunity to put something like that together. So it's gonna happen. It's not, it, it'll take some time, but uh, this is the foreseeable future is what you'll see. Okay, so a question from one of our Zoom users is, how are the energy burden tools connected to available incentive dollars for local affordable housing projects? Are there incentives available for manufactured housing? I can answer that. So on the energy burden tools. So for those, we don't have any incentives set up that are specifically for that, uh, that does it by race, but we can do it by energy burden. So what we can do is we can say, uh, or what we do is in our prioritization for our funding is that we include energy burden as a very high uh, weighted uh, uh, scoring part of the mechanism to determine if uh, if that particular area, you know, if it's BIPOC community with, with high energy burden, that's going to move you up our list a lot faster as far as a high, highly valued target uh, for us to uh, to reach and to provide services for. That's what we're currently doing. That's how we're able to get around with the research that we did and finding that uh, the energy burden is highest in those BIPOC communities, uh, hands down. And now we know exactly where they are and what their number is, and also the type of building they're in. We can uh, dial in uh, to the outreach for that, but we can't, because that's not legal, we can't we can't do it by race, you can't fund by race, but we can fund by energy burden, just like we could fund by rental burden, or we could fund by water burden or whatever. We can fund in that way because we know the evidence shows that the BIPOC communities in Oregon are highly burdened in that way. And that's how you get that population to rise to the top of the list and become a priority. And that's how we, that's how we get around uh, and they've allowed us to do that. They've allowed us to use energy burden in our programs. So uh, we're using that, and I'm happy to say, at least on our energy assistance program for billing, that's what we used, and that's exactly what resolved an equitable distribution, and we saw those populations just go right to the top when we did that. And that was a really uh, pretty thing to see. And so we want to see that done in our housing stock and this piece, too, for weatherization. There was another part of that. Uh, the manufactured housing thing. So for manufactured housing, do we have funding for manufactured housing? Um, was it specific to energy burden? I can't remember. Yes, go to uh, OHCS's website. We have our very own manufactured home uh, program uh, for replacement and repair. Uh, and it is quite sizable. We just uh, uh, provided uh, a sizable amount of funding um, about a half a million here in the last few months uh, of public purpose dollars that will be going towards the purchase and offsetting of a manufactured home uh, to upwards of $25,000 uh, that will go down for a down payment on the purchase of an energy efficient, uh, a very energy efficient building, uh, manufactured home. So we've got them. Go to the website.
uh, it, that's exciting. We're one of the first. We're one of the first states to have it. I'm sorry. It's Oregon Housing and Community Services. Go to our main website. I, it's OHCS. Dot org. Thank you. Yes. Dot Oregon. Dot gov. Where my organization operates in Douglas Coos and Curry County, we're already experiencing some severe limitations from lack of available contractors. So thank you for the workforce training that you're proposing. How do we help funnel potential workers into that program and will there be scholarships or stipends available for MWESB? Yes. You send them, we'll cover it. Okay, so one of the things that's 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 where we're at. So we we will provide it, and so um, um, it'll be a heck of a waiting list. But we're going to be pretty busy every week with different types of certifications and trainings that we'll be having folks uh, take. And Coos Curry, yeah, we know, uh, and uh, we work with uh, uh, Orca, right? Um, and we recognize we were just there with our own state people our monitors to train a contractor on how to insulate an underfloor in a manufactured home, which is not something we do, right, typically. So realizing the need there in those counties, we recognize that. And we recognize the struggle even in the metro area as well, uh, with high population, urban. But when we get out to those territories, man, it's just not there. So we're looking to help encourage agencies and other organizations to even create their own contractor. And so uh, for uh, if you have an affiliation with the work for affordable housing or weatherization, and that's where you've got these folks focused to, come, okay? Yeah, and I actually might add real quick on that. One thing I failed to mention is there's also a um, what's called the contractor training grant that Odo is applying for on behalf of the state. Um, that's hopefully going to bring about $2 million in workforce development money into the state. And our plan right now with that is to kind of support and build on existing work that's being done, particularly in rural areas and disadvantaged communities. Um, so hopefully through that, we'll be able to also create some more space for folks to uh, pursue other trainings within the state. So. I'm going to supplement your question as well. Um, related to workforce, I think this funding will increase the demand for workforce, but there's also on the construction side the impact on the supply chain, which I think if you're all building projects, you've seen the impact on that. Could you kind of speak to like um, what work is being done to address those supply chain issues and with this funding? I, I can give it my best shot to start um at the state level it's obviously a, a challenge like i you know the state department of energy doesn't have much control over the the supply chain is the unfortunate reality i think and we see from a lot of our partners we work with whether it's utilities or whomever that these are real supply chain challenges and i'm sure you all experience this more so than than we do um i know in at the federal level another part of the inflation reduction act has been investing in supply chain and i know that there are there's work happening there and you know who knows what that ends up looking like but hopefully we start to see some impacts of that and, and things loosening up a bit um but i know that's from my perspective not a super satisfactory answer but maybe dan will uh, have a better one yeah we need congress's help on that one right so we need to go further upstream to congress to be able to incentivize the distributors and manufacturers and or assist them to be able to meet the demand with what we're going to be sending them with all they give us all this money we're going to be asking for a lot of heat pumps our biggest concern is the is the request for heat pumps, right? And uh, uh, a lot of distributors and manufacturers will go, yeah, no, you can't order 100 and warehouse it, we'll give you 12, you know? So, cause we're gonna give, we gotta keep business going in this part of the company. Uh, so for them, they're good, they have to, they're gonna have to do this. It's a huge demand for manufacturers, not just the distributors. But this is what I see. And this is, this is the strategist for Oregon and, and, and what we're seeing. If we have a system in place that can provide, you know, quick access to the distributor and manufacturer getting paid quickly, and we have a system in place that works well and packaging and leveraging those dollars, those distributing uh, streams, they're going to pick up on that. And they're going to realize, well, my distribution, my manufacturer is in Georgia, but it takes me, uh, it takes, you know, it takes six months to get paid or get any of this stuff, you know, through 
uh, to Kentucky, but it takes me 30 days for Oregon. Where am I going to go? Right? They're going to want to get paid. So the benefit for us strategically and business wise for how we would set it up is this is why this is the one stop shopping, get things to happen quickly. That's why it also feeds our businesses, the businesses that are going to be ordering these uh, heat pumps, uh, because we're going to be competing uh, with uh, 49 other states, right? And so we're going to need to have a system in place for you and for the distributors and manufacturers that can flip this money quickly because they'll go where the, the money, uh, trust me on that, having run an ARA program, they'll go where the, where the funding is is quickly resolved uh, so that they can get paid and pay their, their debt, debt debtors as well, because they got to go out to China and other places to get get their equipment as well. So I don't think any of the heat pumps are all 100% parts here. So they're going to need exchanges and they're going to need credit lines. So does that make sense? I'm saying nod heads. Yeah. Okay. I think I saw some more hands raised. I'm curious if any of these funds uh, with electrification, with the more sophisticated systems, bigger energy loads on new construction, sometimes that's requiring multiple electrical services or step up transformers. Those are not inexpensive things in a project. So I'm curious if any of these funds are available for that or how that is considered in any of these programs. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess the short answer is immediately no. The funding from the rebate program is explicitly for either appliances or in-home um, type of work. It's not kind of the, I guess, front of the meter infrastructure from the utility side. Um, I would say, and I, I believe we didn't have any utility representatives in the room, um, that we have utilities in Oregon that are very interested in the same types of goals that we are interested in as far as making homes more efficient, making homes safer, and delivering on um, the emissions goals we have as a state. And so I'm optimistic that uh, there, there may be some opportunity to work with our utility partners to think about how we can address those. It's something that's also come up, this is tangential, but it's also come up with um, charging for like school buses, for example, and that becomes a cost that's not always um, obviously something that could be covered like upfront from a rebate program. Um, so I would say I have some optimism that those are things that will hopefully start to be addressed, especially in these larger multifamily properties. But to my knowledge, based on how the guidelines are written for the federal rebate programs we have, there is not funding for that type of infrastructure investment. Yet, right? This is where you got to go upstream. Uh, so, right? So we've got to go upstream. Uh, uh, we've got to get Congress to be able to put together that incentive. I can share with you that I know Portland General Electric uh, and Pacific Power uh, have written the legislature and the Public Utility Commission. I've been in those meetings where they have written about concerns of getting transformers that they need to have that the distributors aren't getting them as the utility. And what that does for us as as developers is, oh my God, we can't we can't move people in. We can't. We need a transformer. We need this on our site. Well, you're not going to get this for another six months. Well, I, my investors, I'm sorry. That's not how my pro forma works out, and my investors need to make sure that I'm getting collecting rent in three months, right? And we're waiting for a transformer, seriously? So these are the kinds of things that, right, you know, that we're recognizing now as developers and in the field that um, we're going to need to incentivize. We're going to, yeah, the manufacturers, we're going to, and the distributors, we're going to need time. And the utilities are facing this as well because they have needs for the infrastructure uh, that they've put in orders for as well. But we're on back order. 2020 really is still ghosting us right now uh, with that, that that hasn't quite bounced back. And we'll probably be, we're probably another four or five years out, quite frankly. The recession took us several years to bounce back from. I think we didn't really come out of the recession. We were one of the last states to come out until 2014, maybe 13, 14. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in a manner of speaking, it, it, yeah, it, 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 changed, it changed the fundamental... Uh, it fundamentally changed how the economy w was impacted in such a way that really caused a caused a uh, a big bump, uh, a real big bump. Yeah, yeah. And so that being said, 
it's it's one of those pieces that um, this is where as states and as advocates recognizing how the business process works for us and recognizing right you know everybody's impacted by that this is where you get uh, you consolidate your utility advocates because I tell you the utility advocates are up there asking for the same thing when they meet with our congressman we need you to incentivize um, somehow the business process so that, that they'll produce more transformers and be able to distribute those. It's the same thing for heat pumps and other things. So um, this is going to be an interesting, interesting grab. So it'll probably be, I, I anticipate start, stop, start, stop for a little bit until we start. And that's probably in the first three years. And I think I'm being conservative. Right. Right. Are there any other questions? Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about stacking of these incentives. Like we're working on a project, and you know we were planning on taking the whole building approach with ORMAP and maxing out those credits, and then kind of backing into what ETO is offering, but now I'm hearing we maybe can also do ODO credits. So can you maybe talk a little bit about how maybe we can prioritize credits and how maybe things can pick up slack that don't cover everything? Hey Jeff, you all right? You need, you need some water? All right. <laughs> well, bravo, you just stacked. Yeah, so uh, the elements there, yeah, the ORMET program backing into ETO, because we package those together. You go to ETO, you're also coming to ORMEP. You go to ORMEP, you're also going to ETO. So we've got that pretty dialed in for that particular funding source for PGE and Pacific Power customers. The one hurt, hurt part is that that's a great program, but it's not, it's not to scale. It's not a state scale program. Yeah, that it takes up 75, 80% of the customers in the state, but we still have 20, 25% of consumer owned utility customers, which are primarily in our rural parts. This is our eWebs, Eugene Water and Electric, or our co ops, um, uh, our PUDs, uh, our munis. These are uh, other utilities that have dollars and programs uh, themselves. Uh, but that also we're limited to. We're, we, we would need a fuel blind program, um, much like what uh, uh, we have with our low income weatherization assistance programs, which, believe it or not, you can also work with them, uh, whatever the local provider is there to uh, get funded. And that's they cover 100 percent of the cost, period. Um, uh, so they're also another uh, group to, to back into. I think what I can say is in regards to how, how we stack those is one good you're going through you are starting with ORMEP and you start we're going to add ODO to this so you're going to see more centralization of this type of work happening at HCS so as affordable housers applying for our funds just like we have the NOFAs you're going to see ORMAPs already included in that but you're going to see us packing more into that ORMEP package. Is it a battery? Yeah, battery. Oh, okay. You killed the battery. Yeah. Does that is that helpful? Yeah. I, I mean, I thought what we'll uh, eventually have is a whole. You'll get a whole guide. Here's 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 your bill. If your building is under twenty five units, 
under three stories, th this is this is probably the best solution of what what you would package. Here's a good example, and here's the incentive. If it's more than 25, you know, and we might even break in for multifamily, you know, high rise, mid rise, low rise, right? And then we'll start breaking things up so. It makes it easy for you and, and the applicants to be able to put through, and we'll just line you up with the, with the project uh, dollars and just and make it make it really easy uh, to get the dollars out the door and get the rebates flipped really quick. These are the hopes and dreams, <laughs> but we've done it before. And we, so if this isn't anything new. Thanks to all three of you for the presentation. Um, you've got working on a project that is hoping to start construction next June, and it would be great to be able to assume we can install mini splits everywhere. Um, any guidance on, you know, are we there yet, or do we need to wait kind of to see what those look like and how they'll be deployed? So is it specific to OHCS programs? Okay. Yeah. Yes. What do you think? Yes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, of course. Yes. It's available. It's available now. Yeah. And that gets into that, how we break it down, high rise, mid rise, low rise. So it just depends on how that equipment lines up. But yes, we'll probably be saying yes to more types of equipment. It's just which equipment goes best with what type of building structure, right? Or what you're planning to put in place, right? It's the same thing with like manufactured homes. We'd love to put all these heat pumps and things in there, but they don't accommodate pre-1980 refit uh, spaces very well, unless you want to bump your hip and shoulder while you're walking down the hall all the time so as it juts out so it's it's a different uh but still it's worth it to get that equipment in there for folks so with the most recent update to the RMAP program with our measures and incentives that were released in July, um, we did increase the incentives for ductless heat pumps. And we also have a bonus for in rural communities um, for ductless heat pump incentives, because we know that the cost to install ductless in rural communities is a lot higher. Any other questions? I got a question. Yeah. Okay, how many are going to go apply for the solar and storage next week? God damn it. Good. Good. We'll, we'll, we'll let you know. Let your director know. <laughs> okay. It's not even my program, but, uh, you know. Uh, we have eight minutes left. Um, I'm going to ask a question that I'm curious about. Um, oh. oh, sorry. So you're talking about program design. Um, is there going to be some sort of um, you know, open, you know, conversation about that? Was what, what were you pointing at, Mecca? <laughs> oh, okay. I'm looking at you now. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll start answering and I'll walk towards Dan. Yeah. Within the ORMAP program, um, a year ago, we created the, the DEI coalition um, with community stakeholders to help inform our program design and advise, advise us on making program changes with an equitable focus. So they've done a lot of great work in this past year, um, namely the new prioritization criteria that we released so we can serve projects um, with the criteria like energy burden, prioritizing that. Um, so those are venues um, um, that we have available. Um, but yeah, we want to, if you have any questions, we're always an open door. Um, and if you want, if there are more opportunities where we can create engagement, um, love to hear your feedback on that as well.
first uh -huh. advantage first advantage feedback who are you with crispin i'm sorry that's right christmas earth of okay all right so yes uh, so one of the things is yeah we do provide the, the dei coalition has members on that and so we can talk with the coalition and we'll expand when we get into uh deeper discussions on that program design but i think the the important part is one we got to show energy savings to a degree but uh, as housers I, I get to wear this how we get to wear this hat of being a houser and saving energy uh so while energy savings is great we have other elements in housing that goals that we're trying to achieve that we can uh we can uh, uh overlook and and use the any additional squeezes that we need to get that technology into the building because we know that it is you know uh, probably the best operational uh, outcome that we would want to have for that building. Okay. You want me to get in my steps? <laughs> I get to sit down now. I feel like doing okay. All right. Uh, my name is Amanda Zuniga. I work with Energy Trust of Oregon. I actually work with Julia and the fine folks who run Ormet because um, we have been um, offering community partner funding, and so I'm going to give a big pitch for we um, got feedback this year from a lot of our community partners, which includes CDCs and housing agencies, um, how to streamline it. And, you know, I understand the different like properties. You're like, what does all this mean? I just want to be able to come to the program and let them know I, this is my portfolio. And so we hear you. We are working on bringing large multifamily into that partnership. So we encourage folks to enroll because we get the wise counsel of folks who are working on ORMEP and energy trust programs to help us streamline. So I like appreciate you giving all these plugs for how to stack incentives because it's a lot. And even if someone were to ask me how much would it cost to do a DHP with all the incentives, I'd be like, hmm, need to think about it. Where are you located? <laughs> are you a rent? Is it a rental property? Um, is it owner occupied? There's all these rules. And so really encouraging people to come um, to energy trust, give us feedback. We have public forums, you know, our advisory councils are um, a really great opportunity to also give public comment and feedback too. Yeah, and I'll also just give a quick plug. I know probably all of your inboxes are overburdened, um, but I definitely recommend the ODO mailing list. There's a lot of great updates there. Energy Trust, ORMAP, OHCS, lots of great updates coming through there. energy incentives uh, been this much available ever, ever. This is like historical. There is something for everybody in here. Uh, if you're low income uh, and you qualify through these programs, your projects are low income, it'll be paid for. Uh, the rebates uh, that are coming through here, yeah, based on the income level, which is our projects, your projects, it, they'll cover 100% of this stuff. That's amazing. Right, Un unprecedented, unheard of. So we're looking at finding projects that have that. Odo's looking for these projects for rebates, and they will funnel them quickly. And that's that's what we're looking. Uh, well, we'll say quickly until the feds decide to, differently, because you know, once they get involved, it gets kind of fun. So not that they're not. They're just one thing I think we can say is the feds are taking their time. Um, quite frankly, they got this money. They got this approved over a year ago, and they finally just got out the guidelines a few months ago. So um, states are just now putting together their plans and, uh, right now. So it's good stuff. It's it's a horrible problem to have to have too. You know, I don't want to say we have too much money, it, but it's a horrible problem to have and a great one at the same time. And so it it's I'm looking forward to seeing how the housing stocks changes and, and adapts to this uh, because I know what the housing stock looked like before Ara came and uh and what it's been uh, been like moving forward so it's just gotten better from where we've gone and where we've been and seeing where we were 30 years ago for our housing stock and where we are now and where i can see us going in the next decade or just in the next five years with this this is huge this is great stuff i'm looking forward to the rebates for myself as well i've got some ideas for some of my my uh my buildings so <laughs> be good stuff any any other questions for us i think we're just about out Yeah, I think we have a few minutes left. Any last burning questions? All right, well, 
If not, um, I just want to hand it off. I, Will and Dan, you gave us some great homework and things to check out. Do you have any closing thoughts you want to leave with the audience? Um, nothing huge, but thanks for this. And this is extremely helpful for us. Um, and I'll just mention again, our website is energy.oregon.gov. You can find our federal funding page on there that'll have a lot of information as we develop these programs. There are emailing lists you can sign up for to be looped into um, the work we're doing on the program design end. And then again, uh, October 4th, 2 p.m. as our first kind of kickoff meeting for conducting public outreach and designing these programs. And then we'll have two more meetings, October 10th and 11th. You can find that all on the website as well. Uh, I would encourage you to attend the gala tonight and hear what uh, my uh, friend, colleague, and former director, Margaret Salazar, has to share about uh, equity and social justice and uh, her approach. Uh, she's transitioning from HUD. Uh, she's going to become a local here uh, again uh, for one of uh, our, our one of our affordable housers. But uh, one element that I, I want to encourage uh, and I want you to know from the White House Justice 40, that initiative that's sent out on all points bulletin of where you're focused and what targeted group you should be focusing and putting together when you put together your projects and uh, uh, as far as scoring and criteria and what we expect to see. And if you don't include um, those types of that that lens, um, you might find yourself uh, uh, being troubled with finding funds. Uh, that's just where things are going, and that's uh, it's been a long time. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So uh, keep the focus on that, and as you put together your plans. So thanks for all you do. You guys are the ones that are are, are going to make this happen. So we appreciate your work.